Good morning and welcome to South Church. I'm Reverend Dr. Sandra Fisher and I, along with my colleague Reverend Denny Moon and the deacons in leadership of South Church, Granby, welcome you to worship this morning. A few announcements. Uh, there will be no Bible study this Monday. Tuesday, we have the food share truck in the parking lot starting at 1.30. Uh, Wednesday, the Waste Not Want Not community meal will be pickup only from 4 until 6 o'clock. There's a robotics can and bottle drive on Saturday morning, the 29th, and you should all make note that the annual financial meeting will be February 13th via Zoom uh, right after worship. Now, if you would join me with three deep breaths, as is our tradition. Hopefully now we are all centered and we can join together in the worship of God. Good morning, kids. Good morning, youth. Good morning, families. Good morning, congregation and friends. I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Now, I'm a big coffee drinker. So in preparing this video, I needed a visual. So I thought I would use coffee and coffee mugs. It's really water, so I don't make a mess. But if you're not a big coffee drinker, and kids, you probably shouldn't be big coffee drinkers yet, you can just imagine your own favorite drink. So lemonade or chocolate milk, maybe uh, juice. Just imagine what is your favorite drink. So in today's scripture, it says something about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's one of the quotes in today's scripture, being filled with the Holy Spirit. So after I read that, I thought to myself, what does that mean? What does it mean to be filled with Holy Spirit? What does that mean to me? And after I thought about that, I thought, okay, when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, when I'm happy, when I'm joyful, I feel like my, my spirit, my soul is like a cup, right? So I have this coffee mug. It's like a cup that's just full to the top. I'm joyful, I'm content, I'm loved. But sometimes my cup feels like it's emptying. Look what happens when I run errands and I feel too busy. Look what happens when I read the news and I see some sad things happening in the news. Look what happens when I focus too much on the pandemic. So now my cup is really empty. Right? It's actually down to here now. I'm feeling like I'm 
I'm draining. Do you ever feel like that? So how do I refill my coffee? How do I feel happier again? How do I feel more joyful? What do you do? Well, I have another mug here. Look what happens when I spend time with my family. Look what happens when I spend time with my dog. Look what happens when I talk to a friend. When I pray. When I go to church. And my mug is already filled up again. Wow, look at that. It's all, all the way up to the top right here. So there's a lot of different things in life that can be draining, right? There's a lot of things in life that can make you feel empty, that might make you feel alone, that might make you not feel close to God. But if we do things that help others, that make us happy, that serve others, then we can refill our cup. We can re be rejuvenated by the Holy Spirit. And it's really that simple. I look for things that make me happy. Spending time with my family, spending time with my dog, going to church, praying, helping others, connecting with others. That helps me fill my mug up, helps me feel filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, as we move forward today in our service, I hope that you can feel your own mug of coffee or whatever it is that you envisioned. I hope you feel your own mug, your own self, overflowing with the Holy Spirit, being rejuvenated. Have a great morning, guys. My name is Beth Nichols and I'm your Deacon of the Day today. Our reading comes from the book of Luke chapter 4 verses 4 through 30. As we hear the words of scripture, let us listen in the words for the word of God. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut down for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet no one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God shall stand forever.
morning. My name is Marilyn Sponzo, and I'm your star witness today. I'd like to share with you my star word for 2021. It's being, an odd word, but one that resonates very loudly with me. In my seminary studies, and now in my role as a hospice chaplain, I've been struck by how much emphasis we place on doing on our ability to think, to act, to perform, to change the world. And that is obviously a noble cause, but in the process, we can devalue the contributions and the humanity of those who can't do. People with dementia, people with physical limitations, people who are constrained in some way from moving through the world in ways we consider normal. And we deny ourselves the richness of fully connecting with God's creation, a connection that is most powerful when we use all our senses. Now, if this all sounds a little too new agey for you, let me give you a concrete example. I have a hospice patient. She's in her 90s. She worked in biomedical research, and then she became a college professor. She skied the Alps. She took up ballroom dancing in her 80s. Now she's confined to a wheelchair and seldom leaves her apartment. But as a child, her father, who was an artist, taught her to appreciate the extraordinary in the ordinary face of nature. So to this day, she can sit and contemplate a flower, its curves, its scent, its color, with a joy on her face that is absolutely glorious to see. Let me share another new agey thought with you. Our being allows others to be. When I am fully present for another person, when I give my full attention, when I use multiple senses to know and understand that person, I am giving that person the love and respect that we all deserve as beloved children of God. Another example. I recently visited with a terminally ill gentleman, 96 years old. I did nothing, absolutely nothing, except sit and listen to him. And occasionally, when appropriate, I responded. And when I left, he said very quietly, thank you for being so nice to me. And my heart broke. I thought how incredibly sad that we have fashioned a society in which a person is grateful for simply receiving the respect that he or she deserves simply by virtue of being. And so my friends, I invite you to take a few moments to just be, to be still, and perhaps you will hear God speaking, not in the wind or the fire, but in a still, small voice. Amen. In these days of confused situations, in these nights of restless remorse, when the heart and the soul of a nation lay wounded and cold as a corpse, from the grave of the innocent Adam, Comes a song bringing joy to the sad. Oh, your cry has been heard, and the ransom has been paid up in full. Be glad, oh, be glad, oh, be glad. Every debt that you ever had. Been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. Be ye glad, be ye glad, be ye glad. Ooh, now from
from the dungeon a rumor is stirring you have heard it again and again oh but this time the cell keys are turning and outside there are faces of friends and though your body lay weary from wasting and your eyes show the sorrow they had Oh, the love that your heart is now tasting Has opened the gates, be glad Oh, be glad, oh, be glad Every death that you ever had been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. Be glad, be glad, be glad. So be like lights on the rim of the water, giving hope to a storm sea of night. fugitives in their flight for you are timeless and part of a puzzle you are winsome and young as a lad and there is no disease or no struggle that can pull you from God be glad oh be of the Lord. Be glad, be glad, be glad. Has been paid up in full by the grace of the Good morning to you and thank you for being with us today. It is uh, wonderful to be worshiping with you. Bob and Brad loved baseball and when Brad was dying, Bob asked Brad to see if there was baseball in heaven. Brad died and two weeks later, Bob woke up to Brad's voice. Brad said, I've got some good news and bad news and the good news is they do have baseball in heaven. But the bad news is, you're next up to bat. Well, that goes with the one of the pastors who got up one Sunday and announced to his congregation that uh, there is good news and bad news. And the good news is we have enough money to pay for our new building program. And the bad news is, still in your pockets. I got some good news this past week. My test came back negative. Bad news? It was an IQ test, revealed by the fact that I told these jokes here. I like good news, and I imagine you do too. But it seems that all good news involves bad news. Why? Because good news means change. You won the lottery, good news. The bad news, you now have a thousand times more close friends and relatives than you thought you had. Good news, you fell in love. Bad news, your world is being turned upside down and will never be right side up again. This is our story today, similar but different. It is a, a good news, bad news, good news story. It goes like this. Jesus grew up in Nazareth 
He was one of the kids running around the neighborhood, helping his dad Joseph in his carpentry business as he grew older. Somewhere in his mid-twenties, Jesus leaves Nazareth to figure out what he's going to do with his life. He spends some time with his shirt-tailed cousin, the fiery prophet, John the Baptist. And then he is baptized, and the Spirit appears above him in the form of a dove. And the Spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted. And then he comes out of the wilderness, Luke says, full of the Spirit. We got a lot of Spirit going on here. And he heals people in Capernaum, and he teaches in synagogues around the area, gaining quite a reputation before he comes to his hometown, Nazareth. So, when he shows up unexpectedly in the Nazareth synagogue on that Sabbath that our story is about today, his reputation had preceded him. Maybe he wandered in a few minutes late to the service, like some of you do. Heads turned, there was a collective gasp. Oh, look who's here. And the synagogue leader handed him the scroll because honored guests were invited to interpret scripture. But Jesus stood up, unrolled it, and found a passage in Isaiah to read. It was a text everyone knew. When Isaiah brought hope to his people, the Israelites, when they were exiled in Babylon, where they had been marginalized foreigners, refugees from their homeland. Jesus took a breath and, and read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolls up the scroll, hands it back, sits down in the teacher's chair. Silence. You can hear a pin drop. All eyes are on him. And then Luke says this. He began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And I wonder why the phrase began to say is there. What does Luke mean? Was Jesus going to say more? Or did he begin to say the phrase, but he couldn't end it, but Luke has shown us the whole phrase? I mean, what? Stop Jesus from finishing whatever was begun. My take on this is that the Nazareth congregation could not refrain from the expression of their civic pride. Oh, there he is. I remember him. Oh, he was so wonderful running around the streets. Good news for Nazareth, someone shouts. Imagine that. Our boy is fulfilling scripture. Joseph's kid, he's going to put Nazareth on the map. Oh, they're not going to look down their nose at us anymore and say nothing good can come out of Nazareth. They can stick this in their pipe and smoke it because he's our boy. He knows who's buttered his bread. And maybe someone even started that ancient Jewish version of the hip, hip, hooray cheer. I don't know. Good news for Nazareth. You see, the cultural dynamic here is, is tribal loyalty. In the ancient world, villages were honor-shame systems. And everything you did, you did for the honor and the prosperity of your tribe, your family, your village. Or else you brought shame to your family and your tribe. The good news of hometown boy making them look great? Well... It's followed by bad news. Jesus, who has been interrupted by this eruption of civic pride, does not join in, but waits until it dies down and all eyes are on him again. And he says, undoubtedly, you want to quote me the proverb, physician, heal yourself. In other words, take care of your own kind, your own town, the village that raised you. Do here what you did in Capernaum. But they have forgotten how the Spirit of God works, so Jesus reminds them. Remember, the prophet Elijah was not sent to any widow in Israel during a famine, but was sent to a foreigner, the widow of Zarephath. And remember, 
in the time of Elisha. There were many in Israel with leprosy, and none of them were healed. But the Spirit sent the prophet to a foreigner, Naaman of Syria, and he was healed. You see, Jesus' words broke the unspoken assumptions of the culture, that your primary loyalty is to your people, your tribe, and your family, not to the people who are different than you. The cultural, cultural rule was that those people are less worthy. They are the enemy. They are a threat to our way of life. They want to destroy us. As in a mafia family, to divide your loyalty dishonors the entire family and potentially endangers it because you can no longer be trusted to be loyal only to the family. See, this is the nerve that Jesus touched, or rather, stomped on. He is asking them to question their very way of life, the assumption upon which they live. And consequently, the people are enraged. And the whole crowd drives him out of town to the brow of the hill upon which the town stands. It is a cliff, and they want to throw him off, a vigilante execution for betraying the rule of tribal loyalty. <clears throat> and then Luke gives us one of those enigmatic, en en easy for me to say, enigmatic statements. Quote, he walked right through the crowd and went on his way, end quote. Sounds like Obi-Wan Kenobi of Star Wars fame. We never hear of Jesus returning to Nazareth, and probably with good reason. What is it that enrages people so that they become a mob and they're ready to take the hometown boy's life? What lies below anger so violently expressed? I read a blog post recently that said, we must seek to understand ourselves because certain feelings masquerade as others. In particular, our grief and depression and fear can look like overreaction, irritation, and anger. The author of a blog post I read said that she realized this on a family vacation. They were white water rafting, and she was terrified that her younger daughter was going to fall out into the rapids. So what did she do? She started barking out orders, sharp and gruff. Her husband said, don't be mad. And she started to cry and said, I'm not mad. I'm scared. This is fear talking. Those are powerful words for her. And that moment of realization helped her look back on some of the most shameful incidents of her life and see them in a whole new light. She said, I'd always wondered how I could be so mean and controlling to people that I loved so much. And to understand that those behaviors were caused by fear and that it was anxiety talking lifted my shame and provided awareness that was life-changing. And from that point on, she endeavored to interrogate her feelings about everything from the stresses of parenting to the grief she felt when her father died. And she realized that often her fear and her grief came out in the form of temper, moodiness, or downright anger. A culture tells a story of meaning for its members according to certain assumptions. And when the security and comfort of our culture is challenged, it threatens that security and comfort that we feel, and we get angry. Why? Well, we're like the mother in Whitewater. If we interrogate our feelings, we can discover that it is not really anger. Under the anger is the fear. We fear that healing the lepers in Syria means that our lepers won't be healed. We fear there won't be enough healing to go around. And one of the assumptions is good news for others means bad news for us. And good news for us, well, that could mean bad news for the rest of the world, but who gives a rip? Jesus is declaring 
that good news isn't just about you. The good news is for all the poor, all the blind, and all the sick. You may hear it as bad news, but there is a way that good news can be good for everyone. And in order to do that, you have to change your assumptions, your rules, your culture. But the people in Nazareth, they can't imagine another culture. They won't question their assumptions. So they want to kill Jesus because he betrayed them. What would that look like in our culture? Well, <clears throat> one of our major assumptions is honoring the individual first and not the public good. Author Robert Bella, in his book, The Good Society, writes that social problems of America today are largely a failure of our institutions, which is caused by, and I quote, our long and abiding allegiance to individualism. The belief that the good society is one in which individuals are left free to pursue their private satisfactions independently of others. A pattern of thinking that emphasizes individual achievement and self-fulfillment. Bella says that the meaning of individualism in our time has become radicalized, magnified. Again, I quote him, a ruthless individualism expressed primarily through a market mentality has invaded every sphere of our lives, undermining those institutions such as the family or the school or the religious organizations that have traditionally functioned as focusing our collective purposes, history, and culture. And this lack of common purpose and concern for the common good bodes ill for a people claiming to be a democracy. Caught up in our private pursuits, we allow the workings of our major institutions, the economy and the government, to go on, quote, over our heads, end quote. <clears throat> I don't know exactly what Jesus would say to us today. Maybe you treasure the individual above the common good. Your culture thinks that individuals are separate from one another and that your pursuit of individual fulfillment doesn't affect the lives of others. Maybe you'll open a copy of Forbes magazine and, and read, quoting them, the top 1% of Americans hold 30.4% of all household wealth in the U.S., while the bottom 50% of the population combined holds 1.9% of all wealth, end quote. But did you get that? The top 1% holds one-third of the wealth, and the bottom 50% holds one-fiftieth of the wealth. My goodness, we attend first to the wealthy and hope that the wealth trickles down to the poor. But I say, look to the poor first. Structure your society so that everyone has health care, education, housing, and employment. Invest not only in the good of corporations, but in the good of the public as well. For human beings are an essential capital investment. And Bella believes that this idea was the intent from the beginning of our nation. I quote him again, our nation's founders assumed that the freedom of individuals to pursue their own ends would be tempered by a public spirit and concern for the common good that would shape our social institutions, end quote. Radical individualism is our culture's equivalent to Nazareth's tribal loyalty. It is what keeps good news from the poor some would say, well, I'm not against the poor getting those things, but where would the money come from? Well, it doesn't take a genius to see that higher taxes on the rich are implied. And I know there are people who would throw me off a cliff for that statement, if, if I had any power at all. Those folks are afraid that they would be left destitute if we followed that line of thought 
But no one is suggesting that an inordinate amount be taken from the wealthy for the sake of the public good. But that is what fear does. It exaggerates the danger. There is good news. There is bad news. But then, there is good news. We don't get it in this story here. In fact, we don't get it until the second volume of Luke. After the Spirit has come to the apostles at Pentecost, there's the Spirit again. And the apostles create a community in which they begin with the idea that no one will be in need of the essentials of life. And it's remarkable because people flock to be part of their community, rich and poor alike. People are giving money, lending a hand, and feeding others. And when the Greek widows are ignored because they aren't Jewish, the apostles recognize that this is the very same thing that was going on in Nazareth. But this time they name more deacons to attend to the Greek widows. Nobody was broke. Nobody was hungry. Nobody was without care. Nobody was without a home. Everyone flourished. It can be done. You folks in Nazareth, no need to be afraid. You folks in America, no need to be afraid. The Spirit can break through into our hearts and open us up to a community of reciprocity and sharing and joy in which the common good is the goal of every person. The good news is that even though we're individuals, we're related to one another. The bad news is that means we have to take care of one another. But the good news is that that is exactly where the meaning and the joy, the healing and the salvation of life is. Amen. Now is the time that we come together as a community of faith to share our joys and concerns. If you have anything you would like to share, please put it in the comments below. Please come into prayer with me. We pray, O oh, compassionate one, for people who are poor and struggling, the ones to whom you came with good news. Challenge us to fulfill that good news to be agents of change and witnesses of love, to be makers of peace and sharers of bread. We pray, O oh voice of freedom, for people who are captives, the ones to whom you came with release, for people who are victims of war or violence, for people who are held captive by ideologies and systems. Teach us to bring justice and to unbind one another's chains. We pray requesting the gift of your spirit, the spirit which blew over the waters of creation, the spirit which was upon you at baptism, the spirit which sustains your vision through the ages. As the spirit was upon you, may we notice her in our world calling us to lives focused on actions of service that reflect your love and your mercy. And now, if you would join me in the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. 
Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faith hearted. Support the weak, help the afflicted. Honor all people, love and serve God. Rejoicing through the power of the Holy Spirit. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.